Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us today. Before we start, we want to remind you that today we have a simultaneous translation in Spanish and English. Instructions on how to operate are presented, uh, going to be presented on the screen. The session is being recorded so that the report can be produced and shared with you. You can use the Zoom's chat feature for comments or questions and answer features for questions to the panelists. Uh, our team will also be uh, collecting questions in the YouTube uh, uh, platform. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos que están acá con nosotros hoy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Before we start, it is important that I share with you the information that there is simultaneous interpretation into English and into Spanish. The uh, instructions to use the interpretation function are will be shown on the screen and we are taping the session so that we can uh, produce a report to share with you. Those of you who are participating can write your questions to the panelists, not only on the chat function, but also on the Q&A. We also have colleagues from our team who are going to uh, be reading your questions uh, and, and also on the uh, uh, YouTube platform. Dr. Juana Herrera, uh, Chief of the Mental Health Section, General Directorate of Health of the Ministry of Health uh, of Panama, and to Dr. Deborah Queso, Director of uh, World Health Organization Department of Mental Health and Substance Use in Geneva, and also to our colleagues in the countries and here in Washington, D.C., my team from the Mental Health and Substance Use Unit, and all that joined us here today. Thank you very much for joining us today. I will pass the word to Dr. Anselm Hennis, of, uh, Director of the Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health Department here at PAHO for his opening remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliveira. Welcome and good morning, good evening or good night to you from where you're joining us today. My name is Anselm Hennis and I'm the Director of the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health at PAHO. This webinar will focus on the effects of COVID-19 on the mental health of persons within the region of the Americas. But we will also consider a global perspective on the challenges resulting from the pandemic. The goal of this webinar is to share and discuss the devastating effects of COVID-19 on mental health. But we also recognize that the pandemic has created a pivotal inflection point with recognition of the importance of mental health to overall health as a result of the unprecedented and untold suffering caused by the pandemic. One in four persons will experience a mental health condition during their lifetime. As such, the inclusion, although delayed in the context of not being included in the Millennial Development Goals, was an appropriate recognition of its critical importance to overall health and well-being. By recognizing mental health, among other non-communicable diseases, the United Nations signaled to the world that mental health is an important component in our approach to development going forward. Nevertheless, the burden of mental health conditions continues to climb, with the majority of those affected lacking access to quality treatment and care. There remains a large gap between the global mental health burden and investment, with countries setting aside an average of only 2% of their health budgets for mental health conditions. Despite the acknowledgement of the impact of mental health, Scaling up proven mental health strategies and interventions remains a challenge. And the stigmatization, discrimination, and human rights abuses of persons with mental health conditions continues. It's the highest rates of COVID-19 and related mortality in the world. And these are associated with high rates of psychological distress. Measures to limit disease spread, coupled with the high COVID disease-related burden and job losses, 
have increased the likelihood of individuals developing mental health conditions for the first time or the exacerbation of pre-existing mental health conditions. There's also been restricted access to services. The PAHO WHO Rapid Assessment Survey recorded important disruptions in mental health services across the Americas. Populations in vulnerable circumstances, particularly women, young people, groups of lower income of lower socioeconomic status, and people with pre-existing mental health conditions have been significantly affected by the pandemic and report high levels of anxiety and depression. Today, we look forward to learning from the experiences and insights from within our region and the wider world. We are joined by the Honourable Minister of Health of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Terence Dayal Singh, Dr. Juana Herrera, Coordinator of the Mental Health Section at the Ministry of Health of Panama, and Dr. Deborah Kestel, Director of Mental Health and Substance Use at the World Health Organization and Interestingly enough, a former member of our department. So it's a pleasure to welcome Deborah. Please let me introduce you to Dr. Renato Oliveira, the Pan American Health Organization Mental Health and Substance Use Unit Chief. We'll introduce our guests and moderate the discussion. Welcome all. Thank you very much, Dr. Hennis. Today, we aim, to, we aim to hear the views of the panelists on the key issues that mental health face today, during, but also after the pandemic. How to prioritize mental health, how to keep it at the top of the public health agenda, and how to mobilize political commitment at the highest possible level. Each panelist will have 15 minutes to speak. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the Honorable Dr. Terence de Yassin, Minister of Health of Trinidad and Tobago. He's a second term Minister of Health and member of the cabinet of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. He has a diploma in pharmacy from the University of West Indies, a postgraduate diploma in international marketing from the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK, a Bachelor of Science from the University of West Indies and a Bachelor of Law from the University of London. Dr. De Yassin, thanks very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's Mr. Dial Singh, not Dr. Dial Singh, but that's fine. Um, I would like to recognize in absentia Dr. Carissa Etienne, Dr. Erica Wheeler. Um, also, I think we have with us Vora Kestel, Director of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, WHO. And thank you, Dr. Anselm Hennis. Participants, Trinidad and Tobago, like the rest of the world, is caught up with COVID-19. What we should aim to do collectively in the region of the Americas is to make sure we don't have a mental health pandemic within a COVID pandemic. Our strategies have been based on population-wide interventions, but we must also recognize the mental health stress placed on healthcare workers. We could never ignore that. They carry the brunt of the burden. As we say, there is no health without mental health. And if we go to slide one and two now, possibly slide two, what is the context, next slide please, context of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. On March the 11th, 2020, as we know, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by WHO. March 22nd, 2020, Trinidad and Tobago closed its borders. March 30th, stay-at-home orders. May 12th, partial easing of restrictions to try to reopen the country. Next slide, please. What has been the general impact of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago? Yes, there has been disruption. Yes, there has been closure of business. Schools have been affected. But in the midst of all of this, there have been opportunities. There have been innovations as we respond to a global pandemic. In Trinidad and Tobago, we operationalized a parallel healthcare system. What that did was two things. One, ensure our traditional healthcare system ran and that we had a dedicated parallel system to treat COVID-19 patients. We digitized services. 
increase home delivery of services so that mental health could be addressed face on. Next slide, please. What has been the impact of COVID-19 on mental health specifically in Trinidad and Tobago? We must recognize, and I always go back to my Bible when I talk about health, the social, de social determinants of health by Sir Michael Marmot. In that book, we talk about two types of persons, persons who engage in health-seeking behavior and those who don't, whether it's for diabetes, hypertension, or mental health, that same dichotomy exists. People who actively seek out, who actively seek out care and treatment, and for those who don't. So in treating with the mental health burden, we must recognize that the normal stressors, the normal response to stressors are fear and et cetera. It's listed there in the increased psychological and emotional stress. These are normal responses to stress, but it is now heightened and places a greater burden because of COVID-19. What are some of the effects? Increase in gender-based violence, child abuse, alcohol, substance misuse which will in fact mean an increased demand for your services. What we have to recognize is one, the need for mental health, and two, lead persons to recognize that they need help and to overcome the old, um, the old problems of stigma. A recent study by the University of the West Indies, next slide please, which I will come to later, spoke to a recent survey of a thousand persons, where 17% of those persons post the pandemic and during the pandemic now are reporting some sort of stressor, some sort of stress, some sort of mental health related issue. Therefore, in recognizing this, what did we in Trinidad and Tobago do? What were the strategies we developed? One, as a small country, we have to recognize that we don't have all the answers. Recognize that. So the same way we ask persons to recognize you need help in treated with mental health, we had to recognize as a small country, we needed help. What did we do? We turned to PAHO to develop some terms of reference, which will provide a framework for us and the operationalization of our technical working group. So recognize, all countries should recognize they can't do this alone. We must establish a mechanism and a program, which we did. The establishment of a mental health psychosocial support technical working group, which will help us manage information, establish cross-sectoral links. Important, advocate, advocacy is important monitoring and evaluation and ensure sustainability. This must not be a one-off intervention because the lessons that we learn now during the pandemic will stand us in good stead post-pandemic. And you must have an action plan. As I always guide my team, a strategic plan is absolutely worthless if you cannot operationalize that plan. So you must have an operational plan based on the tried and proven principles of management, coordination, communication. That is what we have done. Luckily for Trinidad and Tobago in 2019, we took a decision to start the process of decentralization of mental health. And I must say that has proven to be a lifesaver for Trinidad and Tobago. Because now, as you will see later on, we can deliver mental health services to people in their communities outside of a centralized institution-based system. Next slide, please. Addressing this issue with the technical working group, again, we have to recognize we cannot do it alone. Similarly, as we approach PAHO for Health, the government cannot do it alone. You must engage all actors, 
all actors in your society who have reach, who have resources, whether it's a non-governmental institution, private providers, professional associations, reach out, reach out, build alliances, build bridges to help you spread your message, help educate people more and more so the individuals under stress can recognize their signs and symptoms and hopefully ask for help. Next slide, please. This next slide is probably the most important slide, but don't get confused. It's a busy slide. But if I ask you to focus on the pyramid, focus on the central part first, that four layer pyramid, I think is a good layout. What that does at the bottom of the pyramid is the population-based measures, the social considerations and basic service and security, population-based. As you move up the pyramid to the second layer, the third layer, the fourth layer, you could see we are starting to narrow the focus from the population to the community, to the family, to person to person and then specialized services. That is what that pyramid teaches us. It gives us a blueprint and a strategic framework. The busy parts of the slide to the left and right, which I will not go through in any detail, it can be read, are simply what I said before. A plan is useless if it cannot be operationalized. On the left and right, are how we operationalize this plan. They are the tactics to achieve the strategic outcomes. So for instance, on the left of the pyramid, some of the groups we are targeting, children. Children are under great stress now for several reasons. They can't go to school, they can't socialize, they can't play games, they are fed up being taught by a computer, they are screen wary. So we have to recognize the stressors that place on that particular population. Single mothers, Trinidad and Tobago has a high degree of single mother families. Many single mothers would have been disadvantaged with business closure. So on top of the psychosocial burden, they also have the financial burden. So we have to treat with them. On the right-hand side, you are seeing where we have data collection. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. And this is what I said earlier, when the University of the West Indies, um, after the start of this pandemic, did a baseline study of 17% of 1,000 persons. Um, having some sort of mental issue that needs to be dealt with. And this brings me back to what I said earlier. Health-seeking behavior versus non-health-seeking behavior. We know from experience, persons in the lower socioeconomic groups across the world do not engage in health-seeking behavior because Maslow's hierarchy will tell you when they are engaged in daily survival, they are not self-actualizing. And these are the vulnerable populations we have to reach. So this chart, and I have four minutes left, focus on the pyramid, that gives you the strategies, and on the left and right will give you the particular tactics you could employ. And who are the special populations? Next slide, please. What are some of the activities conducted? Mental health presence at media conferences. We have been speaking to the population. Dr. Othello has been leading that charge. Facilitating World Suicide Prevention Day, World Mental Health Day, media messaging, educational messaging. But you must train people on the ground. Online training, webinars, coping strategies, a closer look at the needs of older persons, like children, older persons have been totally isolated. Whether they are isolated in their own homes or in their long stay institutions, they can't see their families because we have locked that off. So we must pay attention to all these special populations. 
Next slide, please. What are some of the activities that we have conducted in response to these mental health needs? Helplines, very important. Tele mental health services, because as the moderator said, face to face medicine, whether it's for clinical manifestations or mental health manifestations, we have to move to different portals. So tele mental health becomes important. Innovations. This COVID-19 pandemic is going to force us to innovate. We launched findcarett.com, an online directory for all mental health services, whether those services are provided by the government of the day or our NGOs. Community voices, work groups, workbooks. So in summary, in my last minute and a half, the issue of mental health in a pandemic, and I know the word holistic is one that is used very often, but this really calls for a whole of government, whole of society approach, focusing on the vulnerable populations because each vulnerable subpopulation has different needs, different wants, and different interventions. The interventions we utilize for the elderly, isolated in a long stay home, are going to be totally different to the interventions that a child who has been cut off from school for all the reasons given, the single mother who is at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy struggling to make two ends meet, their needs and mental health challenges are different. So we must educate people, lead them to the well, and sometimes even force them to drink. In all of this, we must be overcoming stigma and make sure our mental health um, solutions are targeted to the right people at the right time. I want to congratulate PAHO for having this meeting this morning. It is vitally important as we move forward to help overcome not only COVID fatigue, but pandemic fatigue. And I thank you very much and congratulate PAHO once again. Thanks so much, Honorable Minister. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure the audience will have uh, questions, but we will leave it for the end. Uh, let's go then to, to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Juana Herrera, Chief of the Mental Health Section, General Director of Health at the Ministry of Health of Panama. She's a psychiatrist with a doctorate in clinical sciences specialized in addiction. She is director of the National Institute of Mental Health she received recognition for outstanding women by the Women's Commission of Parlasen in 2019, among other many recognitions. Dr. Herrera, thanks again for, for joining us, and, and the floor is yours. Muy buenos días. Primero Good morning. I would like to uh, greet the Minister of Health of the Republic of Panama. I, or rather, uh, he sends his regards. He apologizes for not being here. But um, this is a very important forum, and uh, I would not miss the chance to share this. Now, our experience in Panama with mental health during the pandemic has to do with analysis of the situation that we have undergone through COVID. April 26th, we had 352, 833 people uh, who were who recovered, represented in green in this chart. 6,209 people passed away and 3,925 cases remain active. Yesterday, there were two deaths reported and 271 new cases, according to the health ministry's report. What has the pandemic caused in our population? Just as the Minister of Trinidad and Tobago said, it has led to a large scale crisis in our population, having an impact on uh, health, uh, the economy, and uh, society. And so that obliged us to adopt a number of uh, measures uh, since, since it started with our first case having 
psychological and emotional impact on our population. And we, of course, that's uh, after we started to have social distancing, uh, people's uh, movements uh, were restricted. There was uh, people's um, economic situation was affected and it affected their families as well. Now, this has uh, led us to adjust our mental health services. Historically, Panama has offered mental health care at the primary health care level since last uh, century, in the 70s rather, and we've been doing that. But with the pandemic now and the uh, restrictive uh, measures, individual individualized primary health care was um, reduced. And so we had to uh, approach mental health through group care. I would like to point out that the government's plan under President Cortizo calls for two main pillars. Pillar four, which is to strengthen health interventions for those suffering from mental health, including depression and anxiety, and also to establish new programs to offer care to people with the drug and alcohol abuse problems. As we heard from the minister in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, this is a problem we already had, but we have had to step up the care given under this category since the pandemic. Now, this is uh, something that uh, is in resolution form in the cabinet. So mental health services, there are two important aspects that bear mentioning how the pandemic started and how that has uh, had an effect on how services are being provided. We have to first recognize that mental health services were reduced in hospitals and in primary care because the priority was uh, COVID patients. because uh, health facilities uh, were uh, focused on COVID patients. And then uh, you have uh, those uh, patients with mental health problems. And so what we resorted to was a telephone service, but the demand that emerged led to a second option, which is mental health services. People when they would call in asking about COVID, we noticed that they were very anxious and needed to have their emotional well-being cared for. So in the National uh, Health Care Services, uh, mental health was included. The migrant population was included. People with disabilities, um, women who have uh, suffered acts of violence and children as well received special care. We had to bolster and uh, add health workers, uh, focusing them on those uh, areas where they were most needed. So what was the response that we brought to bear during this time period? First, the inclusion of mental health in the COVID response, because ever since we set up the emergency centers, mental health, emergency mental health uh, offices uh, were set up in those uh, cent centers from the outset. And we still have that combination of services within these operation centers, and that has proved to be very important. We also have multi-sectoral coordination mechanisms, intersectoral intergovernmental networks, as they've come to be called. And this intersectoral network for mental health has been very response. And we also coordinate with other sectors, working with PAHO uh, in Panama. We have mapped out the different actors and the interventions, and we were able to uh, 
uh, we, well, we have had to focus our efforts on COVID patients. We have uh, support lines for mental health, a rapid response uh, a team, a rapid response teams have been set up as well as intersectoral support in mental health. Now, this I was already referred to by the Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, and so in all the different levels of care, we have integrated the intersectoral groups. And I think the most positive thing that we need to stress is that mental health during this time has made it possible for us to establish a partnership, uh, an alliance of sorts among all actors in our communication and uh, promotion activity. Other important actors have also taken part in this and the support mechanism, and I want to stress this, we spent more than 10 years working on um, mental health and psychosocial services. And this is something that we were able to strengthen. This is something that usually healthcare workers don't specialize in rolling out to support in the communities. We set up mental health offices, um, rapid response teams, Uh, psychiatric uh, services offered over the telephone, telepsychiatric assistance uh, to assist those people who could not leave their homes because they felt much anxiety or would have uh, panic attacks, and this was very helpful. The provision of medicine was somewhat uh, hobbled by the process, but there were places set up making medications available to those patients who needed it. So this is an important uh, topic for us to, means for us to carry out uh, these uh, efforts to provide mental and so -called psychosocial health. Now, something uh, worth mentioning within the realm of mental health during an emergency, We've spoken of uh, help provided broadly and different plans that we have, but we also have to include healthcare workers themselves into this care because they are overwhelmed with the work that they have to carry out. And this is something that affects them physically and emotionally. In addition to trying to save people's lives, which is uh, the responsibility of healthcare workers, they had essentially become a family member of the hospitalized person who could not receive visits. And that ultimately has an effect on them. And so there are protocols in place to offer care to not only healthcare workers, but the first line workers addressing uh, the pandemic. Now, the minister also uh, raised the matter of uh, partnerships in countries such as ours, where resources don't abound, this is something we've had to turn to. You can see on the screen different government uh, organizations uh, and the health minister himself in the picture, as uh, this was uh, headed up by the president of the Republic in which state ser um, services uh, were uh, provided to assist in the COVID response, diplomatic missions, uh, media, civil society, NGOs, the uh, Ecumenical Committee of Panama Universities, all pulling together in this effort. This is uh, the Panamanian uh, PAHO director and the Minister of Health meeting in a working meeting receiving an uh, update on the situation. This is done daily from the first day, has been done daily. And uh, the minister asked me to express uh, thanks for the ongoing technical support PAHO has provided us. We've been uh, working with uh, different protocols the coordination of the networks for mental health. 
and other linkages. We don't get to rest. We continue uh, bearing down and working on uh, meeting our different needs. And so, given the fact that uh, patients or uh, healthcare users weren't able to go to the health clinics uh, from the first day of the pandemic with the shutdown, and so we had to get the message out how best to handle the situation, as uh, mentioned, how to uh, help families help their children uh, during lockdown, uh, the fact that uh, there are no uh, neurological pathologies and uh, sleeplessness that people suffer from. Now, and so uh, professionals that trained in mental health care played a very important role in this. Now, what is the president's uh, idea? There are two important aspects uh, in the government's plan, but during the pandemic, from the president's office that there are two very important laws that were enacted. One, set up uh, the national emergency system as a part of the transformation of the emergency centers. And it speaks of providing care for during a mental health crisis and addresses suicide now enshrined in law, meaning that it is uh, a binding aspect of the law that didn't exist before. And another law enacted during the pandemic, which uh, sets up the legal framework for comprehensive uh, uh, prevention efforts to prevent suicide. Now from the, the first lady's office, different uh, fora were convened to address suicide prevention. The mental health day was uh, decreed and also a program to prevent suicide in schools. Now from the ministry, mental health teams were bolstered, reinforced. The minister asked for primary care teams to be strengthened and to coordinate uh, in the MH gap program again seeking to strengthen mental health services provided as well as uh, those teams that is teams working on COVID also need to be trained in mental health by way of conclusion then uh, the current objective of mental health in Panama is to uh, overhaul the care provided for mental health in our public health facilities, given the new epidemiological situation that we face. And uh, this uh, geared toward a gradual return to normalcy. So where are we headed now? As proposed by our ministry, sustaining mental health. What we don't want to have happen is for us to uh, make this huge uh, effort to provide for people's mental health care and then uh, cease this effort after the pandemic passes. This has to be sustained over time at the same time that we address other pathologies that emerge. And we all agree on this. This is our message. We have to invest in mental health, that is to invest in the development of our countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Herrera. Uh, let's wait for the questions. Uh, we are very interested to learn how Panama and Trinidad and Tobago uh, placed uh, mental health at the, at the top of the agenda. Uh, let's go to, the, to our next uh, panelist. Since 2019, Dr. Deborah Kesso is the director of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Use at the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Kesso obtained her uh, Master of Science in Psychology from the University Nacional de la Plata in Argentina and her uh, Master of Science in Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK. Welcome again to Paolo Deborah and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renato, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for this opportunity. A pleasure to hear uh, Minister of uh, Trinidad and Tobago and uh, colleagues from uh, 
Well, Panama, I just realized that I wanted to speak in Spanish. So my apologies to translators and interpreters. I'm going to switch language. I was thanking uh, everyone for the opportunity uh, and uh, to tell you how much I enjoyed the presentations of the two countries. Uh, sometimes uh, at the WHO we have uh, an overarching uh, view of what happens uh, based on data, but uh, we don't always get into the specific details of each country. Can you see my screen on the my presentation on the screen now uh, this from the world perspective the global perspective we're going to speak a bit about mental health and preparedness and response during the COVID-19 pandemic I apologize in advance perhaps some of you have heard me say some of these things before at least some of you but this is uh, the current situation. We've had to uh, update some of the information in my presentation. So after uh, being in this pandemic for a long time, uh, we do have data now that we didn't have a year ago. One thing is to uh, estimate uh, what the impact would be. Now we actually have concrete data and examples uh, that are more Broad. You can see different manifestations of COVID-19 on the population at large, uh, anxiety, depression, stress, anguish. So it goes from five, uh, from seven to 54 uh, percent, anxiety six to 51 percent. And so it depends on uh, where the measuring measurements have started. And whether these measurements were made of the whole of society or of specific uh, groups, for example, vulnerable groups uh, about which uh, we were just speaking, healthcare workers, for example, as a vulnerable group, which uh, are exposed to uh, feelings of anguish, stress, anxiety, and constantly. And uh, over time, uh, some of these uh, phenomena uh, level out. Now, as far as how this uh, manifests itself in mental health, neurological problems, in addition to anxiety and depression or delirium, uh, when people are hospitalized in different symptoms uh, that uh, we see every day, um, sleeplessness, insomnia, or headaches, or having uh, your olfactory or taste uh, senses uh, affected, which are neurological uh, results, and severe mental health conditions. This is an at-risk group. Uh, for uh, contracting COVID-19, a uh, reason for which we rec we uh, recommend uh, that they be made a priority group for receiving vaccinations. So again, we have examples of long-term COVID infection, mental neurological manifestations such as uh, fatigue and depression and so forth. Now, regarding, regarding uh, the use of substances and addictive behaviors situations vary according to the different mechanisms used uh, by people to overcome this stressful time now substance users are Um, vulnerable to COVID and other problems such as uh, overdose, suffering from overdoses and so forth. So this is one of the messages uh, that we are trying to get out. Adversity is a risk factor for short-term and long-term mental health problems. Depicted here by someone who's got a huge uh, weight on his back and he's uh, struggling to get up the hill 
pre-existing mental neurological and substance use disorders exacerbated by COVID-19, add to that stigma, less uh, access to social support systems, and so forth. The direct uh, and indirect results or consequences of pandemic, the pandemic and the disease itself, and all of the problems that come along with that. Social isolation, distancing, how that affects children at home and uh, their access to education, uh, mothers or uh, elderly people. So having heard my colleagues, the minister and our colleague from Panama, these are countries that have been working really hard to uh, build up their mental health services. Those that have done that are better positioned to respond to a mental health crisis such as this relative to other countries that haven't made that investment uh, for whom it's that much more difficult. We conducted a survey. Dr. Hennis spoke of this in which we measured worldwide 130 countries reported 93% of the countries declared that at least uh, one mental health or neurological or substance abuse uh, or use system has or a number of them have been interrupted because of the pandemic. Now, just last week, this was published. This is uh, fresh information. And what this shows is that mental health, neurological and substance use services is the area hardest hit of all the different areas assessed in this survey. Forty-five percent of countries said that these were indeed the most affected services. When we look at what services were affected by the pandemic, promotion and prevention at the top, schools, of course, aren't working, suicide prevention services have also been interrupted in a diagnosis and treatment, neuroimaging, psychotherapy, psychosocial care have also been interrupted. Some, surprisingly so, someone who needs a psychotherapy, psychosocial services, uh, some of those services rather can be provided uh, online at a distance. Life-saving emergency care. And lastly, services and work done for the most vulnerable populations, older adults, children, adolescents with mental health conditions or disabilities. We're also staying abreast of the COVID-19 impact once we get past the most acute moment and think about the long term or long haul impacts rather of COVID-19. And so again, What we see is a, an, a, a di diminished cognitive uh, or cognitive impairment, fatigue. This may lead to uh, depression, anxiety, substance use, post-traumatic stress, social stigma implications. We can't really say much about this. We just see that it is exacerbated and there are other neurological sequela that uh, have become apparent. So we have been working 
from the very first publications we issued on uh, this, uh, some were published in uh, February, March of last year, publications for the public, and now we have a broad array of uh, messages, uh, publications that we put out to the public at large, to healthcare providers, to different types of programs, resources for public clinicians and program managers. For first uh, level response, those people with uh, COVID and uh, otherwise affected by the COVID crisis. Now this has been translated into Spanish. So feel free to uh, visit our webpage and you will see a host of publications material available to you. Now shedding light on mental health issues uh, is very important and much has been done to that effect. That's why we've been working very hard, whether we're talking about the WHO or PAHO, Last April, the Director General of uh, WHO sent uh, a communique to everyone saying it's very important that uh, mental health and psychosocial support be a part of the COVID-19 response plans. And that message continues to be stressed last May at the WHO with the support of other organizations, we drafted a document that I also recommend you read. It's very worthwhile, a policy brief on COVID-19 and mental health that the UN Secretary General put out. And so the it's a target audience isn't just ministries of health, but head chiefs, uh, heads of state, presidents, stressing the importance of mental health, health care. It's also um, highlighted in different uh, health handbooks and guides with a focus on mental health and substance use. So it's within that context, uh, as you know, of the 194 uh, countries of the WHO that uh, meet every year in the World Health Assembly. Of the, there's a group of 30 countries that discusses the agenda for the assembly, the WHA, and there was proposed by Thailand, in fact, and more than 40 countries uh, joined this effort. A decision was made, it, uh, made uh, to include mental health in the COVID response and the preparations uh, carried out to respond, but not just that. The mental health action plan was proposed. There was an ex uh, something added to the original uh, 2030 plan to promote mental health preparedness and response for public health emergencies, where we speak of uh, promoting education, advocacy or outreach, addressing stigma, early detection of mental health issues, treatment, rehabilitation, human rights, and people's dignity and to we sought to reach people in high risk groups or vulnerable groups about which we spoke earlier and we also promote here the use of technologies which is very important because we've seen now with all the different uh, apps and telephones and different means of alternative means of communication available to us, we can provide support to those who need it. We have to avail ourselves of this technology to overcome the 
barrier that health, uh, mental health care providers have faced uh, trying to reach those who need it. That's very important, as we know. But uh, a distance uh, intervention is also valid. Something else that's very important is to generate options where for those uh, people who do not have access to technology, we can't overlook that. We have to uh, place as much uh, attention on those groups as on the ones that do have access. One of the most important components of this decision that we hope will be confirmed by the World Health Assembly in a few weeks is the, the fact that the countries themselves will undertake or commit or invite one another and all of them to designate financial resources for mental health because without financial resources, we don't go anywhere. Of course, each country will determine how much is the amount. Maybe a rich country will uh, allocate millions of dollars to mental health and others will allocate uh, less. But it is also a matter of reorganizing existing resources uh, and taking into account basic elements. This is a significant element so that once the emergency is over, we won't forget and we will continue to include mental health. So increasing knowledge in mental health among healthcare workers is another priority. Also uh, the uh, use of MHA in the region of the Americas is important and the continue to follow the impact of COVID-19 in the mental condition of people and matters related to substance use and um, etc. It's important not to lose sight of the life course and the different impacts on life course and um, I'm going to skip this part so that we can leave more time for the discussion. The countries are requesting WHO to increase its capacity at country level, at regional level, and at central level. And this was mentioned by the minister and Dr. Herrera as well, uh, how they resort to PAHO, the minister himself said that uh, they requested help from PAHO and so did Dr. Herrera. So the country office needs to be there uh, listening to the needs and this also needs, of course, to have resources for that. We're always uh, fighting for more resources, not only regionally, but globally and nationally, of course. So uh, to sum up, what we are proposing as the way forward and the support to, in recovery from COVID-19, we needed to build mental health services for the future. As I said at the beginning, and those of you who are connected here or work in mental health care know this, if you have a healthcare system, it is much better than if we don't have that. We need to build these systems if we don't have them. And now that mental health has come to the forefront, we need to continue to highlight it so that we don't forget it. We need to use this moment where there is interest in mental health to promote sustainable reforms regarding mental health. Also, the second point is to include mental health within uh, universal health coverage. We don't need to continue with the idea that mental health is its own thing and it's separated. Uh, and it's for people working in specialized institutions. No, that's not the case. Mental health needs to be incorporated in every level. Every health specialist needs to have a component of mental health in all areas. And the third point is to build human resource capacity to deliver mental health and social care. 
and uh, to take social matters into consideration. And number four is organizing community-based services that protect and promote people's human rights and, acti and actively involve people with mental health conditions and psychosocial disabilities in the design, implementation, and monitoring of services and uh, so this is the number four, making sure that in fact, uh, uh, the needs of those who really require it are being met. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Castro, and thanks to all the panelists for the comprehensive presentations. Uh, let me turn then to the, to the questions of the audience, as I heard that people have been sending questions even before the, the event started, when, when people were uh, doing their registration. Just for you also to know, we have more than 450 people joining us um, here uh, today. Uh, the first question that I have here, it goes to the Minister Deyal Singh. Uh, what could be done, at the, I, I think this goes in line with what uh, Dr. Castro was just uh, saying uh, towards the end of her presentation, so what could be done at the national level to increase the investment in, in, in mental health, in mental health services? Thank you, thank you very much. Let me say at the onset, investment in health is one of those areas where people want a return on investment. If I invest a dollar, how do I quantify that? That is easy to quantify with diseases like diabetes and high, high potential. But in mental health, it has to be looked at in the context that investment in mental health may not be as easily quantifiable. However, it can be quantified by the quality of life by the individual, and most importantly, the family and community that receives those mental health services. So what we have done is started this whole process of decentralization so that the investment we make redounds to the benefit of the patient. It means that the patient can seek and lead a more productive life, get a job in their community, and therefore productivity increases. So investment in mental health results in one, decreased hospital capacity. You don't treat them as an acute or chronic case again. One, community involvement, quality of life, and productivity. So our investment is predicated on that. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Minister, for your for your answer. We have another question here to Dr. Ejera. Uh, it's from Robert Perez. Uh, the elder have been one of the most affected groups in terms of uh, mortality, but also isolation and, and, and stigma, and especially the ones who, who, who live in, in, in residences. So the, per the, the, the question from Robert Perez is, uh, how to implement specific actions to, to protect the mental health of the elder, of older people, especially the ones who, who live in, 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 in residences? Yes, thank you very much. This is a very important question. And before talking about uh, mental health of those who live in institutions, uh, the number of the elderly will continue to increase and we will need to prepare ourselves not only in terms of mental health, but also the number of other uh, needs that these um, populations will have. The Minister of Health met uh, with um, um, different um, elderly institutions um, and care facilities. Uh, so there was a, mini, a meeting of the Minister of uh, Social Development, the Minister of Health, and they started talking about the fact that caring for those who live in 
institutions for the elderly, if, if they are public institutions uh, and, and not private homes, this should be under the purview of the government, both in uh, general health as well as in mental health. Public health in our country covered the needs, but it is a responsibility of the health region where these institutions are located. So these different homes and residences where the elderly live uh, are going to be the purview of the regional health, and this should be the way. Uh, we have another question here from Antonio La Palma. Thanks, Antonio, for, for, for bringing this question. It's, uh, it's a question for Dr. Deborah Kessel. It's related to mental health policies and, and the existing experiences. So Antonio is asking, are policies uh, in mental health uh, really incorporating the, the focus on, on, on community mental health? And what can be the, the, the support or how can uh, social psychology and community psychology support policies on, on, on community mental health? Uh, he's also asking how can the community participation be involved on the development of strategies for the integration of mental health into, into primary health care? Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a difficult one. Thank you, Antonio. Um, we have developed um, tools so far that are aiming at some of what you said. I mean, we're definitely promoting uh, community-based uh, mental health services, but also uh, some of the tools that were developed uh, trying to reach out to first responders, for example, so the ones that are not clinical and are not um, uh, for the public, are looking at, at some of those uh, interventions that are how to engage and to provide tools and capacities. It is called I'm okay. Okay, I'll continue in English so that. Uh, the translation is not a mess, but um, th th there is one in particular that I invite you to, to look at that is called um, a basic psychosocial skills. Yeah, that's the one. And there you can see something like that. Then we, we just came up also with, a, with an intervention for older adults that also looks at cultural issues and communication things that are not the uh, fully technical ones. I think we still have a, a, a room to, to improve that and we still need to be stronger in, in how to engage the community. And we were discussing this like yesterday, I think with a couple of colleagues in my team about that. We need to do more in that. So if you have any, any information or, or material to share, well, what, what I can add briefly is that I'm aware of uh, countries that are practicing very interesting uh, um, modalities of engaging community, uh, the local communities in uh, providing uh, support or in generating uh, uh, some kind of uh, um, momentum around mental health and sharing uh, messages that could be useful and reaching out to many and, and, and things like that. But I think, uh, yeah, there's a long way to go there. Over. Thank you. Thanks again, Deborah. We, we have a question here for, for Minister Deyal Singh. Uh, and I think this builds up on, on, on what the minister has told us on, on all the developments in, in Trinidad and Tobago and the scaling up of mental health services and the prioritization of mental health. The question is, uh, what are the main challenges that you foresee in the health system to address mental health in the long term? And, 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 and what are the ways to try to address those long-term challenges? Thank you very much. So the challenges facing mental health in Trinidad are obviously going to be different to other countries. Our biggest challenge in Trinidad and Tobago, which is probably unique, was that we had a very centralized system 
where we have one mental health hospital treating both acute and chronic patients where patients could be housed there for 30 and 40 years. It was a centralized asylum-based system. In 2019, we started the process of decentralization to take it back to communities. That has been the major operational challenge, and that process has begun. In that process, we have been able to decrease our bed occupancy at that facility from 1,000 to about 700 to eight. So 300 people have gone back to communities. So that process goes on. The other challenge in a small country like Trinidad and Tobago, where everyone knows everyone, is that of stigma and discrimination. And I think all countries have that, but the smaller the country, where people live in close-knit villages and communities where everyone knows your business. Stigma in, and discrimination is something we have to work on aggressively, very aggressively. And we have to tell people, and I have said this publicly, the way we treat diseases like diabetes and hypertension, and I have said this in my speeches, we never tell anyone snap out of diabetes, it's in your mind. Snap out of high cholesterol, it's in your mind. But we tell people with mental disease, snap out of it, snap out of it. So that is the, <laughs> I see you all laughing, <laughs> but that is the reality. You can't snap out of mental disease like you snap out of diabetes, it's just not possible. So our challenges going forward are one, continue the process of decentralization, two, decrease stigma and discrimination and get communities to understand what mental health is, what mental disease is, and shift the paradigm from talking about mental health to mental wellness. And that is the path we are continuing, starting to talk about mental wellness as opposed to mental health. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Thanks for, for your answer. We have another question here to Dr. Herrera. Uh, in fact, we have a few questions around this same topic, uh, which is related to the mental health and well-being of, uh, of, of health professionals. So the question is, uh, how, do, how, in your view, in your country, uh, the pandemic has affected health professionals? Uh, so they are basically asking your experiences in the country on how do you see the, the, the health professionals being uh, affected. Uh, and the rest of the question is on how to protect the mental health of, of, of health professionals, especially because uh, we know that the demand that they receive is probably going to, to, to continue. Uh, this is not a, a pandemic that ends from, from one day to the other. Sí. Muchas gracias. Eh, una pregunta importantísima porque siempre miramos hacia... Thank you. That's a very important question. We always focus on the health uh, services provided people, but we forget sometimes about the health needs of health care providers in Panama. The, uh, much uh, like I said earlier, this is a pandemic that has affected everyone. No one has... Uh, been unscathed by it. Now, when the pandemic was uh, at a more acute phase in our country, not just uh, healthcare workers, but the first line task force, civil protection, uh, law enforcement, uh, other ministries, and even uh, trash collectors were uh, uh, having their mental well-being and health affected by this. And the uh, health care providers themselves have uh, had their uh, mental health affected. Now, we set up offices uh, to provide 
mental health care services to the health care workers, uh, at least uh, someone who could talk to them and hear them out. And it was uh, decided that this was a problem that needed to be addressed in a more uh, long-standing way. And so residents and interns, residents uh, spoke of how Healthcare workers are being affected uh, with anxiety and depression, and a large proportion of them uh, have uh, suicidal thoughts. And so this is an approach that we have to have according to the protocol that we've adopted uh, that I addressed in our my presentation, the healthcare uh, protocol to offer care for healthcare workers, help for those who help others. Now, In the uh, National Education uh, Educational Council has spoken of the need to offer support to uh, doctors in training, residents, because we see that uh, that group is particularly hard hit. These are young doctors, young healthcare workers, and nurses. Nurses are the ones who oftentimes are working 24-hour shifts in addition to following orders. They also provide emotional support to their patients. And so we did approve a guidebook uh, protocol to help health care professionals to keep them from uh, uh, experiencing burnout. I think every country needs to provide this type of care so for health care workers who have been subjected to this crisis and have spent the better uh, the whole year offering care to the population. Renato, may I'd like to add something. This is a very important topic, and so I do have something I would like to add to what has been said. So for uh, first line health care providers, it is important that they be cared for, perhaps that they be given more uh, of a uh, break between shifts to have an opportunity for them to uh, gather with peers and talk about what they're going through, the stress they're feeling, that might not be made of this need, uh, this type of contact or exchange among peers, because in the long run, and not even so much in the long run, because we're already seeing the results of this, there are consequences in people and uh, given the type of work they carry out. Those in charge of uh, shifts, those in charge of uh, these healthcare providers, be it a doctor or some administrator, they have the responsibility to make sure to offer venues and opportunities for exchange one year on, I do think the time has come for a uh, minimal effort, minimum effort be made to provide care for healthcare workers. What are the basic needs that can be provided for so that this very difficult time in which someone is sick or family members uh, who are also affected by their loved one being sick, that there be at least uh, some basic provisions uh, made for there to be an exchange among peers about how these uh, workers are feeling. Many years ago, primary psychological um, care uh, document was uh, produced and uh, it provides some basic uh, information along these lines, but I think it's worth uh, taking a look at again. Thanks very much, Deborah. Uh, 
Well, there are more questions, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time. So just to say uh, thanks very much to all of you. And before uh, Dr. Hennis gives his uh, closing remarks, we would like to remind all of you that uh, uh, PAHO has a, a, a website, and in that website, we have a specific web page on mental health and COVID, where uh, a lot of material from PAHO, from the World Health Organization, uh, it's all there, and it's uh, quite uh, accessible. Uh, my colleagues will, will, will post the link here in the platform, so so you can uh, be aware of the link. Uh, Dr. Hennis, your, your, your final remarks, please. Yes, thank you so much. And this really was a very rich discussion. And let me offer my special thank you to the Honorable Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, um, um, Dr. Terence Dayal Singh. We give you an honorary doctorate once you take part in our events. Dr. Juana Herrera and Dr. Devra Kestel. We learned so much. We learned about um, country experiences. We learned about the global picture, the impact of COVID, um, in, in increasing psychosocial stress in populations, and impacts to the vulnerable populations, even healthcare workers in particular. We learned about the disruption of services. We learned of the importance of advocating, working in public health institutions, building alliances and partnerships. We heard the all important discussion about investment, investment in uh, mental health services and systems. We learned about the importance of decentralized care and we heard of the example in Trinidad and how they've begun the process and how it basically made such a tremendous positive impact to the delivery of care during the time of the COVID pandemic. We also heard universally from Panama and Trinidad and Tobago and from the global perspective about the importance of strengthening uh, mental health systems and services building a way forward to the future, and also keeping the innovations after COVID, the importance of the digital platform, the helplines, and, and just so many more things that um, we learned today. And, we, and also the importance of mental wellness as a construct. Now, to close, I'll share a little bit with you. Um, in terms of, in May of 2020, the United Nations Secretary General issued a policy brief title, COVID-19, and the need for action on mental health. And this indicated three actions to minimize the mental health consequences of the pandemic. And even as I say this, what comes to mind is the whole construct that the Minister of Health of Trinidad and Tobago shared, you must have an action plan, not just a strategic plan, an action plan. And this is one such. And the first action of the COVID-19 and the need for action on mental health is to apply a whole of society approach to promote, protect, and care for the mental health of all. This policy brief highlighted mental health as an essential component of the national preparedness and response to COVID-19. The pandemic has revealed widespread acceptance and enthusiasm for the incorporation of mental health and psychosocial support in the COVID-19 plans. Nevertheless, governments still need to commit sufficient funding but this approach to be appropriately implemented. And even beyond the pandemic, governments need to continue to provide sufficient funding for the development of services for mental health for the future. The second action recommends that we must ensure the widespread availability of emergency mental health and psychosocial support. The pandemic has unequivocally reiterated the key relevance of mental health as a human right at all must have full access. This will require comprehensive communication to ensure that mental health and psychosocial support is widely available and fully accessible. The world has also seen how digital technology has delivered remote mental health and psychosocial support interventions through telehealth. The pandemic has brought mental health into focus and we as a region must harness this moment to building back better, or even preferably to building forward fairer. This strategy must address the need for investment in mental health, the incorporation of innovations and in service provision, the importance of multi-sectoral and whole of society approaches, and critically, the need for political engagement at the highest levels if there is to be sustainable change. Addressing mental health is central to achieving universal health coverage. And we heard this from the presenter from Panama. 
and we must commit to this ideal. COVID has highlighted the importance of reorganizing mental health services in the region of the Americas to advance the model of deinstitutionalization in order to bring mental health services, meaning promotion, prevention, treatment and rehabilitation into the 21st century. And we are very inspired by the lessons here from Trinidad and Tobago. Mental health services must exist in all communities. And as I said before, they must be fully available and accessible so that persons with mental health conditions can fully exercise their human rights. Thank you once again to all to our, um, to our presenters and to you all our participants. We value your contributions, your questions, your interests, and we ask each of you to advocate on behalf of mental health. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gestel. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, thank you, and good luck, everybody. Thank Bye. Thank you, Dr. Juana Herrera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moderator, thank you.